I'd like to now introduce and welcome the Honourable Mary Waldridge, Minister for Community Services, to the stage. Prior to being elected to the Victorian Parliament in 2006, Mary was the Chief Executive Officer for the Foundation for Young Australians. Mary was a senior advisor to the Federal Minister for Industry and worked in New York with McKinsey's and Company, McKinsey and Company in, in, in Sydney with Consolidated Press Holdings. Mary is the Minister for Community Services, Mental Health and Disability Services and Reform. She has been at the forefront of the Coalition Government's overhaul of the state child protection system, securing a Victorian trial of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, whole of government action plans in alcohol and drugs and family violence, and reform of community mental health and drug treatment services. Please welcome Mary to the stage. Thanks very much, Michaela, and to you and Emma, thank you for hosting today. It's great to again be with Colleen and James um, and have the opportunity to talk with all of you today. I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners who have loved and nurtured the land we meet on today for many, many hundreds of generations. Um, and thanks for organising the forum. I think uh, with your own pitches for your uh, committee and the voting that's going on, you've got a little microcosm of what we're going through on a bigger scale, so, uh, so you know how it is. I like to characterise when I think about it, our relationship with VCOS as rigorous, challenging, um, but also respectful and collaborative, and that's how it should be, focused on the priorities that we have. How do you improve the lives of vulnerable Victorians? How do we work with families earlier to ensure that we can address the issues that they face? And how do we ensure that all Victorians can live happy and independent lives? And we know these, that we know these are not new issues and we are seeing significant increases in demand in a whole range of areas and for a whole range of reasons. No one believes that you can solve intergenerational neglect or disadvantage in one term of government. But I do genuinely believe that we are on a pathway of reform to address these very significant issues. And at their core, we've both, well, in three, the investment, the policy and the processes in place to positively drive the reform we need to see so that we can achieve these outcomes. And there's a couple of key elements that are overriding in terms of this reform. At its heart is Services Connect, and you all will have heard me talk about Services Connect before. One key worker, one plan for the whole of the family in the context of their full range of needs. And the trials that have been going on with DHS and now the community sector partnerships uh, with eight of them across the state, uh, 119 organisations, many of you will be involved in Services Connect partnerships a real opportunity to intervene early, to identify the range of needs and to actually address them before things, things escalate, whatever those needs might be. It might be housing, it might be um, uh, neglect of children, it might be disability, it might be uh, parental mental illness or alcohol or drug abuse. So the capacity to work comprehensively with a new platform for human services delivery through Services Connect. We've also got the Children and Youth Area Partnerships, which are really now just starting to get underway, and that's acknowledging the importance of place. The capacity to look at a grassroots level and collaborate across the agencies, both government and non-profit, and others who are involved, to drive the changes that they want to see at a local level. And those Children and Youth Area Partnerships, I'm already getting feedback, are starting to do exactly that as they gain momentum. I had a police officer just the other day say how excited he was about his local one and the collaboration with both the, the Education Department, Human Services Department and the Community Sector Organisations, conversations that would have never happened before. And the third element of the broader reform is the Community Sector Reform Council. The collaboration, I think, like we have never seen before, of government and the sector working together to identify the pathway to reform and how that can happen with genuine co-design and genuine engagement and honest conversations around the table. So the broader reform aspects that we are driving to try and um, achieve the objectives uh, of working effectively with vulnerable families are delivered in a whole range of ways and in a whole range of themes. And there's a couple of key ones I want to touch on. 
joining up our service response is absolutely crucial, as you all know, as all of you have been trying to do for a long time, often despite the government, not with the government, in terms of funding, in terms of programmatic responses, in terms of accountability, all of those sorts of things. And Services Connect is just one example of that. Taking innovative new approaches to drive that joined up response for the change we need to see. The ramps are another perfect example. Trialled in 2011, 2012, evaluated significant difference working for the safety and wellbeing, working with uh, women and children at high risk of violence. And now with the funding to roll that out right across the state. It's been great work um, and now is actually going to translate to, to safety and protection for women and children um, right across Victoria. The multidisciplinary centres are another example of that. Child protection, sexual assault services, police coming together and now bringing family violence services uh, uh, through police and community sector family violence services to the table as well as we build the new ones that we've recently committed to. And at the heart of all of this is also having more flexibility on funding. And one of the things we've really tried to drive is freeing up the funding so that you have the capacity to make decisions about what's needed when as opposed to um, uh, seeking to, to um, perform to the requirements of very narrow funding guidelines depending on whatever program it is you're funded under for a particular um, issue. So we're trying to drive through our reforms the capacity to join up our response, be innovative, but evaluate and continue to invest and roll out. Equity of access is another key theme, and it's happening in a whole range of ways. The NDIS is a classic example of that, where we know for too long too many have waited on lists or have been unable to get access to the disability services and support that they need. Recommissioning has also been another area where we've been seeking to drive um, a, a quality of service right across the state, no matter where you live, and backing that up with additional funding in areas that have traditionally been underfunding rebalancing those investments through the additional money that goes in so that right across the state you have access to high quality community mental health services, high quality alcohol and drug treatment services um, and not necessarily having to come to Melbourne particularly from regional and rural areas. And therapeutic care is another area that's absolutely critical in terms of the quality of access. An initiative that was started under the previous government that's been evaluated, that is being rolled out significantly and with a commitment now within 18 months that the whole of res residential care will be therapeutic right across the state. Opportunities for young people who are in residential care to get that high quality support that they need and that they deserve. Third area is the accountability. I think, uh, and this is challenging, and this is an issue that the Community Sector Reform Council's been working on. How do we actually measure outcomes? How do we actually know what's being achieved rather than what governments traditionally asked you to measure is what you've done? And I think there, that is an issue that the whole world is grappling with, but one that we are, I suppose, committed to. And now that we have greater transparency in our funding, now that we have uh, a greater ability um, to start to measure, at least articulate what it is, the outcomes we want to achieve and flexibility of funding to achieve those outcomes, um, we are further down the track and I still think still on a road to measuring those outcomes. And the fourth area I wanted to touch on is our workforce because we don't do anything without our workforce and we know that. Our work, workforces are so crucial and so vital to the work that we do. Which, um, uh, and on the issue of SACs, in terms of that, um, what you'll recall is last election we committed to funding SACs up to 200 million. Well, it was obvious once the decision was handed down that it's costed more than that. And we've already put, in this term of government, more than 200 million in to meet the commitments that you have and the requirements under funding under SACs. And I'm very pleased to commit today that the uh, re-elected coalition government will commit to continue to fund the sector as required under the SACS case through the forward estimates and Treasury estimates that's $160 million uh, approximately next year um, and obviously those numbers will continue on in the years to come. So there are very key, I think, differences in terms of what the government and the opposition is offering. What, we, what you have seen, I think, and experienced and lived over the last four years is a government that has been totally committed to driving the reform that we need to see to change positively the outcomes for vulnerable families. Now that is challenging, it's difficult. We have sought to do that in partnership and collaboration with you. 
And I think our cha ongoing challenge is to actually live those messages and commitment about co-design and knowing that we will get even better outcomes in the future. We've backed it up with investment, more than $1.1 billion of additional funding for vulnerable families um, and young people uh, over the last four years, an investment that helps drive and achieve the reform. And structures that articulate and collaborate and commit to working with you to drive the change. We haven't seen a lot of detail, I think, in terms of uh, uh, Labor and what they're planning for the future. There is only 12 days left and we haven't yet had an articulation on so many fronts. But I think from the government, you've had a demonstration over the last four years about our commitments and what we're seeking to achieve and a very strong commitment to continue to work positively for vulnerable families in this state. Thanks very much. Okay, so in opening, you answered the first bit of the question, Mary, about um, the equal remuneration order. The second piece of the question um, is around the commitment to a level of indexation that you will be, what level of commitment to indexation you'd be prepared to fund community service organisations? So what I can commit to, obviously, is the, the three-year process. Um, as James said, we, uh, I actually fought, and I think many of you know very hard, um, in terms of the outcomes, uh, in terms of the last indexation uh, rate, ending up at 2%. Uh, we will continue to negotiate and work with the sector, work with VCOS, VCOS work with all of you. Um, as they're set. But it's important to note, and I know SACS is paying a commitment that you need to, but the effective indexation this year was 5.5% when you put indexation plus SACS. It's a huge, huge investment um, in the workforce that is absolutely vital and needs to continue. But these numbers are very significant mm. and, as I said, $160 million just in the equal remuneration order for next year. Um, we'll continue to negotiate and work with you on the indexation going forward. Uh, yes, so would, would you like to answer uh, the, the question that Sandy, Sandy's point around um, the increase in the obligations that organisations have from 9 to 9.5 yeah. in terms of superannuation? Yeah, and as you'll know, we haven't been able to uh, fund that increase. I think uh, the um, decision to uh, halt those increases has been one uh, welcomed widely um, as that is further reviewed. Um, so I will advocate on behalf of the sector, um, but uh, it hasn't been able, something that we were able to commit to in the 9 to 9.5% um, in, the, in the last increase. So I think all of the, I mean, all of the parties need to be on notice. Vekos will be advocating very hard with all of you around the, the, impa the impost on, on our organisations of the, those increases. Another question? Uh, Cathy Leach from Australians for Disability and Diversity Employment. Australia is at the bottom of OECD countries for people with disabilities living on or below the poverty line. This is a shocking statistic and surprising for a country like Australia. As employment is the main way out of poverty and as DHS is the premium Victorian government department working for people with disabilities, what is the percentage of people with disability in your departmental workshop, workforce? It's, um, and thanks, Cathy, for the question. It's actually a question I've asked a number of times, not only in DHS, but actually right across government. And one of the things in the establishment of the NDIA that we've been working with the Commonwealth as well about uh, getting people with a disability into the workforce, which they've actually done, I think, quite, quite well. The challenge is, is that many people choose not to disclose. So it's something that's measured um, uh, regularly by the um, public sector, I'm gonna get the name wrong, but the um, public sector commissioner. Uh, and uh, what the, the disability action plans have been the mechanism by which to try and raise awareness, raise engagement and improve our level of employment right across the public sector. Now, as part of our state disability plan, we've got a commitment to continue to push the disability action plans, not only in government, but actually more broadly as well. Uh, recently, I've just announced further funding to actually evaluate how we've gone on the DAPs, what's actually been achieved of them. So are they, uh, do, are they something that uh, organisations and governments are using to tick the box or are they actually driving the change we need to see? 
and, and funding to evaluate that and how we can actually do better on those disability action plans so that we um, can refocus them, target and drive momentum for the change so we can have increased employment for people with disability, both in the public sector but also more broadly in the private sector as well. So it's an issue that I think there's a lot more opportunities for the future um, and one that we have a commitment to try and drive and improve. Kathy? Thank you for the opportunity. Kathy Landbot from Good Shepherd. The loss of the education maintenance allowance is very significant for the families that we work with um, and we know the protective value of educational engagement, prevention, early intervention um, across the life course. How will your government fill the gap left by the EMA in a way that supports students who are not only from the most disadvantaged schools but because there are disadvantaged students in, in every school and in a way that ensures that a student in the same circumstances who may, who may live in a very different part of the state or be in different schools receives the same sort of support. In other words, in a way that is means tested, targeted appropriately and individually um, matched to their needs. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. First of all, I want to make it very clear, and obviously this is not my portfolio area, it's Martin Dixon's, um, but, uh, you know, I've, I have an a interest, of course, as we all do, in terms of what's happening. The fact is, is that the former Federal Labor Government insisted that the Victorian Government discontinue the EMA and channel that funnel, funding directly to schools as a condition of signing up to the Better Schools Agreement as part of Gonski. And so that's what we did. What we've then subsequently done is given $42.5 million to the most disadvantaged schools to replace that funding. And I think, and I don't know the percentage, but most parents, the majority of parents were giving their EMA funding to the schools anyway and letting the schools make those decisions. So what we've decided to do is give $42.5 million to the schools um, to uh, make up in some way for the replacement of the EMA and let the principals then decide about how that funding is utilised for the, for the benefit of vulnerable children. Um, in addition, and there is significant Gonski funding, and James has gone through all sorts of arguments, the fact is, I think it's $5.4 um, billion of Gonski funding is committed over the six years by the state government, is the money is going in. And that's going into the schools and the schools and it increases and, and as the agreement was with the former Labor government is it is a hockey stick, it's more as the years go on, but there is significant funding um, and it does make allowances for all those factors of disadvantage that James outlined so that there will be additional funding to schools consistent with the Agonski agreement um, that goes in that allows the schools then to make the decisions about how best to target that fo uh, funding. But in the broader context as well, there's now a billion dollars more in schools than when we came to government, and we're seeing better outcomes. We're seeing 40% of Indigenous students going on to university rather than 22. Um, we're seeing um, a, a range of outcomes uh, across schools and also through TAFE, and we can get into that if people want to go in, because the fact is in TAFE there's also $400 million a year more in TAFE than it was when we came to government, from 800 million to 1.2 billion. So there's a range of investments, but back specifically to the EMA, it's going to the principals, and the principals are then making that call about how to then uh, uh, direct that funding for the benefit of their school population. A couple more questions, one here. Hello, my name's Helen Cooney, I'm the CEO of Caroline Chisholm Society. We support women um, during their pregnancy and with early parenting and some of life's most difficult circumstances, so we um, certainly deal with vulnerable clients. Um, the members and volunteers were really pleased with the strategic nature of the announcement around the investment in Services Connect, but I have to tell you that I've never seen a reaction quite like the positive response they had to Labor's announcement of a Western Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, I'm wondering if li the Liberal Party will match that commitment, and if it won't, whether it will, is considering um, extension of the Cradle to Kinder program into the other catchments around the state. Thank you. Um, so at the moment, uh, it's a coalition government that's building the Children's Hospital at Monash. Um, and from my perspective, in my portfolio area, there's, there's eight specific neurodevelopmental beds um, for that under eight 
uh, age group um, and additional children and youth mental health services. So it's actually very exciting what's happening in there. Um, I can't say, I can't make an announcement today or say anything in relation to the announcement out in the West. Um, but what you've mentioned is we've actually had, as a government, a very significant commitment to those uh, early engagement with from pregnant mothers through those early years. So uh, it was an election commitment cradle to kinder last time um, and you know, I've been very pleased at how it's worked and the response and the impact that's having and it's a result of frankly discussions with people in this room who came up with the ideas in terms of driving that change and the need then which we've, we've sub subsequently implemented. So you can be confident through things like Services Connect, through intervening and engaging with families early, identifying needs that we will continue to invest um, in working earlier, as early as we possibly can um, with vulnerable mums um, and their children, even if it's um, you know, prior to them during, during the pregnancy process. One more short question, Joe. Joe Cavanagh from Family Life. Um, under your government, uh, Minister, there's been a number of different ways of um, contracting with the sector which have been trialled, like recommissioning and then under Services Connect, um, the notion of competing partnerships and more recently some just direct announcements of funding directly to organisations as well as call for tenders for some new initiatives. So I'm wondering for those organisations that are looking at end of contract in June next year, what's your preferred process that you'd be recommending for looking at those those contracts and ways of uh, maintaining diversity in the service system. Sure. Um, and it also goes to an earlier comment that Colleen is, we are absolutely committed to uh, a range of services and service sizes um, in the community sector. Uh, and I think the experience has been in many ways when you compare say the mental health recommissioning to the AOD one, when agencies applied individually, it was a smaller number of agencies that were funded. When agencies applied in consortia, um, as they did with the AOD, we actually ended up funding over 80 organisations. So um, in many ways, the way that the sector responds um, is part of the determination of the outcome of how, uh, of who's funded and how we go forward. Um, and uh, some of the collaborations we're seeing with things like Services Connect, I think are very exciting, acknowledging that Innovation can come from anywhere, um, and it does, and we want to continue for that, for that to thrive and, and be successful. In terms of tendering processes, um, we've actually just, and, and many of you will have submitted to the Community Sector Reform Council, uh, commentary and thoughts in relation to both recommissioning but broader tendering uh, approaches. And that's a reflection of us saying, we want to actually get people's feedback. We want to work with you, the sector, on ways to think about how to do this. Because there's not one size fits all, there's not one approach that's only going to work, and there's ways that that can be improved and resolved. So I can't, I'm not, I wouldn't, I'd be wrong to stand here and say there's a decision about what would happen next year, and it's going to be A, B and C, because um, it will be very much based on the feedback I've already had from the Reform Council, um, which articulated a range of things that need to be think, thought about differently. Some work that the Reform Council's commissioned, which is actually on what are the range of tender, or, you know, of, of options like the ones you've outlined, and there's some thinking, and I think it's ANZOG that's actually doing that work, thinking uh, for the Reform Council to then advise government. Um, so from my perspective, it is totally consistent with this idea of co-design that we will actually work with the sector to determine what's the best way to go forward. And it may be a different approach for different types of services, um, uh, and that's to be worked up together. Okay. Can you all join me in thanking Mary? Can I just say I do think we're having a, a demonstration of a vibrant um, approach to democracy this morning, both in all of all of the three of you being being um, but making yourselves available to be held accountable for um, what positions and policies you take, and all of us as board directors of Vicos also um, having the opportunity to be held accountable for the work that we do. So thank you very much for making the time. It really, I know that you've been on this, you've done this gig quite a bit, all three of you over over this period. You've got 12 more days, um, so 
all the best of luck for you in, in, in that period. And thank you very much for being here today to all three.